Good evening. This is the Anchorage Planning and Zoning Commission. It's 630. Uh, staff, staff, we have a short board. Am I correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, usually a short board is considered five. It's a bare quorum. Well, when I count, I come up with five. Oh, you're absolutely correct. I was counting the... We could ask Lori to move over one seat, but that might get... Mr. Potter raised his hand. He's willing to come forward also. Um, as each case is called, then I guess we will give each case the short board option is how I would picture we handle that. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Any commissioners have any objection to that? For the, for the audience here, um, we did not know we were going to have, Ms. Yoshimura is also willing to step forward and fill a couple seats. We can, we can take care of this here. Um, when we have a short board, the applicants are given the choice if they want to continue at no cost. They normally get advance warning because we normally know in advance. We, don't, we did not know to just now that we have a short board. Um, when there's a short five-member board, a postponement can be offered. And if it's agreed to, then we'll work out the date. So if you're an applicant in the audience, would you um, please, please do that? Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mr. Ferguson? Present. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Spring? Here. Mr. Cange? Present. Mr. Spinelli? Here. Mr. Walker? Ms. Dean, Mr. Strike, and Mr. Sporhays have been excused. Thank you. Well, no, we don't know. If, I, I'm instructing Mr. Walker, so we're gonna we're gonna continue here for a minute. Um, Mr. Spinelli, will you please handle the disclosures? Sure. Uh, are there any commissioners wishing to uh, disclose any conflicts? Hearing none. None. No disclosures. I, I, okay, no disclosures. Mr. Spring, will you please handle a consent agenda? Uh, yes, uh, I'd be happy to. There's no uh, items on the consent agenda. However, I would like to make a motion to postpone case number 2015-0081, Yosemite Drive Upgrade Design Study Report, uh, to the to be rescheduled for October 12th meeting. Motion I made. Do we have any objection? Seeing and hearing none, that, that is postponed to October 12th <coughs> on that. Thank you very much. That brings us to case 2015-0084, a rezone. Oh, pardon me. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to case 2015-0086, a context-sensitive solution uh, for Eggloft Drive in Girdwood. Do we have a staff report or do just the applicant? Um, I can uh, make a short statement. Okay, please do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Department of Public Works is proposing to upgrade Eggloft Drive uh, from a dirt road to a paved collector street. Um, the draft design study report has uh, two uh, concepts uh, for what the road would look like. Um, the report is recommending um, the concept two is the, is the preferred uh, concept for the road. Um, the Girdwood community has expressed a preference for that, um, for that concept because there's a curb and gutter um, only on one side of the street. Um, it's more in character with uh, other roads um, in the uh, in the in the community. Um, the Girdwood Street Maintenance um, also prefers this alternative. Uh, the non-motorized transportation coordinator prefers this alternative because of the separated multi-use uh, pathway on the east side of the street. Um, the um, uh, planning department's recommending approval um, of the draft design study report subject to one condition, which is to uh, 
uh, resolve the need for um, uh, trail uh, speci tr lighting specific to the separated um, uh, multi-use pathway. Um, and uh, that's all I have, thanks. Oh, um, I'm sorry, uh, one other thing. The, um, the project team has been having ongoing uh, meetings with uh, the Girdwood Board of Supervisors um, and um, uh, we, planning department didn't receive any com comments from uh, the Girdwood Board of Supervisors, but they might just be uh, withholding comment until um, the, the next uh, step in the context sensitive solutions process, which is the uh, plans in hand in front of the Urban Design Commission. But that's just a, um, a guess. Uh, but we, I just wanted to point out that we hadn't received comments from the Girdwood Board, Board of Supervisors, but the project teams had several meetings um, in Girdwood and, and uh, had a meeting last month um, with the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Do any commissioners have any questions for staff? Mr. Cange. Thank you, through the Chair. Just given the location's proximity to wetlands, do you think 20-inch uh, fill and backfill is enough? In this area, is that up to design standards here? I, I would de defer to the project team. I didn't know that there were any wetlands within the project area, um, I don't believe. But, but those kinds of engineering uh, questions, I, I just, I, I wouldn't know the answer to that. I apologize. Thank you. No. Anyone else have any questions for staff? I have one question. What is the what is the issue with trail lighting? Um, well, the the Girdwood uh, code um, uh, calls out lighting for streets and uh, and for trails. And um, I guess um, I wasn't certain whether or not there had to be a separate dedicated. Th there'll be lighting uh, along the street uh, for sure, but uh, uh, I wasn't sure if there had to be a separate set of uh, pedestrian lighting along the trail or not. And uh, that's something we'll just have to work out. Okay, thank you. Is the applicant here? We get to start with a question for the applicant. This is a short board. Uh, do you do you want to go to a postponement or are you willing to continue with the short board? We'd like to continue. Thank you very much. Proceed. My name is Michelle Ritter. I'm with Dow, Dow Engineers. Uh, and with me this evening is also Aaron Christie, who is the project engineer. Um, as Francis stated, this is a project to bring Egloff Drive up to collector standards. The project area extends from Alyeska Highway to Coriolis Drive. It will include paving the road, um, widening the right away from 60 feet to 80 feet, uh, providing landscaping, pedestrian improvements, overall improved drainage and lighting. Uh, the, as stated, the existing right of way is 60 feet. There are about 11 foot travel lanes. It's not um, paved or marked. So if you see in the pictures to the right or left as you're looking at it, there's kind of no delineation for traffic patterns and there's quite a bit of uh, drainage issues due to the current design. We've done an extensive amount of public outreach throughout just the concept report and through the design study, we've made public presentations to the Girdwood Land Use Committee, the Board of Supervisors, the Trail Committee, various stakeholder meetings. Um, we've come to this board to introduce the concept report. We most recently had a public meeting and site visit or site walk with the community August 21st um, and have been apprising them, taking their comments to, to kind of modify the alternatives as we move forward. A lot of the comments that we've heard have to do with parking and currently um, without the delineation, people can kind of park as they will uh, along the Egloff Drive corridor um, and also providing connections to the various trailheads. They'd like to see maintenance uh, reduction through the drainage and surface improvements. They also would like us to consider grading any portion of the road does that, that does not get paved through the first phase of the project and overall just um, improving the drainage to the end of the project area, which would be Coriolis. They've also had concerns about the pedestrian crossing across Alaska Highway and have asked us to um, just continue coordinating with the fire station, which is um, currently undergoing an expansion project. As part of this 
um, design study report, we did develop two conceptual sections. Um, this one just extends the right of way for the, four, the full 80 feet. You'll notice that on uh, the west side, we have a 19 foot shorter, and that's just because we want to kind of show that we will be using the full 80 feet so that we can acquire the necessary right of way so that we don't have to go back and um, get any additional right of way later. And the second concept, so they're somewhat similar, um, but the second section is kind of what we've moved forward with and um, applied to the, to the two alternatives. One of the questions that we heard from, from this body last time was about the parking. And you did ask us to kind of look at how we could provide additional parking. We looked at um, providing perpendicular that would overall um, require greater right of way width, e even greater than the 80 feet. And we would start to encroach into the adjacent floodplain. This is also not supported by the municipal engineer. We evaluated angled and it's not possible because you can only approach from one direction and that's from the south. So people are coming in from the north, they would either have to circle around the driveway behind the fire station or they would have to um, be forced into doing a U-turn. This um, variation was also not supported. The different drainage improvements, um, just overall with grading and I'm sorry, with paving, we'll be improving that. The right-of-way requirements are gonna require 20 additional feet. We will be taking that from the west. All of the property adjacent to the corridor to the west is owned um, by HLB. So it will be done through a public use easement. And that will also, we will also be required to get some drainage easements through, through HLB. Um, other considerations that we looked at was traffic calming that had been discussed, but overall uh, we've talked at great length with the community and the traffic engineer, and it's pretty much been agreed upon that at this point traffic calming measures are not necessary. So um, this is the alternative one, and you'll see that it's um, the whole 80 feet and it has parallel parking through the entire swath of the project area. The major concern with this, while it does provide a lot of parking, it also creates uh, a speedway kind of appearance when there are no cars parked. And so this, this alternative is not preferred. Alternative two kind of bottlenecks it in um, for a portion of the road so that it kind of slims the road appearance until we get around that corner. And then there's about 15 uh, parallel parking spaces that have been provided. That in addition to the parking that's being provided with the fire station renovations um, and potential other parking that we may be able to provide um, at an offsite location seem to be adequate for the needs. Overall, the project is funded by a $2.1 million grant and that includes the design, the right of way acquisition and the construction. We have a spreadsheet that kind of shows the phase one and phase two development overall it's a total of 2.6 million we'll likely be able to get the first phase um, designed and paved and phase two would be um, designed and graded but not paved and with that i'd like to reserve my time for rebuttal okay, well there is no public hearing so oh. i don't think we need a rebuttal okay but your time is reserved do we have any questions for the design team Mr. Cage. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so the parallel parking that you have on the southern side of the street, did you um, speak to the community council about that? I mean, obviously they wanted the other two alternatives would have been better and allowed for more parking. But with those issues, what, did, what comments, if any, did they have on the parallel parking? Um, to answer your first question, yes. The, the Gerwood Board of Supervisors and the Land Use Committee has seen the alternative two, and that was actually what we presented at the public hearing on August 21st. Um, they were generally supportive of that. The only major concern was that there isn't park, parking directly adjacent to the Lion's Head picnic area, which encompasses the first four parcels from Alaska Highway um, to, the, to the south. However, the way that's gonna be a soft shoulder, we can design the, the drainage swell so that you could actually pull up and have a temporary parking for unloading if there was a large event. So we think through design, we can mitigate their concerns. Mr. Roy, are you done, Mr. Cage? 
Mr. Robinson. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, first of all, why? Why? What was the rationale for the uh, traffic engineer not not supporting angled parking? Um, well, specifically in this uh, Title IX that governs this section of or Girdwood and the section of the road, it requires that it's perpendicular parking. So by code, it actually is required. Um, I'm sorry, parallel parking um, is required. So angled or perpendicular would require us to get a, a design waiver through the Zoning Board of Examiners and appeal. Um, and then also she doesn't support it because the code, the, the maneuvering won't work. And it kind of creates a situation where people are backing out into a collector road, which they do not support. Okay. I, 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 when you were talking about the, the parking not being supported because of the U-turn, isn't that the same that same situation we have with the parallel spaces that are being provided? I mean, to use those, you have to go down to the end of the road and you turn and go around as well, right? Um, you would. I mean, you could still. I mean, they're they're parking that way today and they're just kind of crossing over. But yeah, ultimately, you would have to to circle around. But then you would be able to pull out and not backing out into traffic. Um, I guess the, the, the real the, the one thing, and it's hard to envision any kind of high traffic in this area as it is right now, but um, you know the idea that you have this sort of pathway um, and to get across the pathway to the library, for example, you'd go through the drainage swell, right? So is that right? I mean, the um, Well, if you're on the west side, if you're parking, there would be enough room so you wouldn't have to go through the drainage well, no. Oh, so, so, but just d disregard the, the parking situation now. So say you're on the, the, the multi-use pathway, gotcha. right? Yes. Yeah. And for you to get over, and, and presumably Girdwood, from, you know, from what I read, they want that to connect in better to the network that already exists. If we can get a DOT to eventually agree to a good crossing of the, the highway, then maybe it does. So I don't know if there's, there's thought about you know where it does neck down or something providing a, a break in the drainage swale or a suggested crosswalk area or something that makes sense so you direct people using that trail to the library currently um, yes that has been discussed and considered um, currently the that trail the separated trail in the west will kind of come up and bottleneck to the northern uh, parking area to the community center we haven't defined another break uh, that we would cross pedestrians at this time. Just what, I, this is my recommendation. I think it's gonna, That's at some point, it's gonna be needed. You might as well think about it now. There's curves, and I'd hate, we'd hate to get into a thing that says, well, we can't have a crossing because yeah. there's a curve. Well, guess what? People are gonna cross, so let's plan for a good access point. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Spring. Uh, yes, um, I'm not sure why the uh, department recommended um, resolving trail lighting is it f because there's no trail lighting in the concept report at this point. Correct. There's a, a difference. Um, one, we're trying to get the the department's interpretation clarified. So um, it, as it reads, it appears as though it says if it is provided, then there's a certain requirement on how to provide that lighting. Uh, what we're hearing now is that if you have a pedestrian facility, you must provide pedestrian lighting. But we are also looking at exploring one of the considerations that we have from what we've heard from the community is they don't want a lot of lighting in the area. They enjoy their dark skies. So we're trying to balance how much lighting we provide. So we are also going to be looking at what the street lighting provides to see if that can't provide the equivalent lighting that's required for the trail. It does seem like it would provide enough lighting for both the trail and the street. Yes. But, um, I guess the regulations, the regulations, right? So we need to resolve it somehow. Okay. Yes. Um, is there a master trails plan out in Girdwood? Um, there, I do not believe so. I know that they have a trails committee, and the trails committee has weighed in on this. I just wondered how this multi-use trail fits in with the plan or fits in with the larger trail concept and is it going anywhere in other words I mean here you're going to spend some money on the trail over there I could see from the map that you gave us that there isn't anything on that side of the street um, to connect to so I just wondered if it was in a plan or something and 
uh, what's the purpose of this uh, trail? Um, and you're talking about the trail on the west the side. The multi-use trail. Well, and that one that has to do with, um, there is a Iditarod trail uh, <coughs> that already runs along. So it's kind of taking advantage of that, the trail that already exists because we do need to provide pedestrian connections on both sides of the road as part of the collector standards. Um, and then it will actually connect up to where Coli Coriolis um, starts. <coughs> So at that intersection of Egloff Drive and Coriolis, and eventually that area is should be developed. I, I don't know how near term that is, but the idea is one day that will be developed. So okay. it will have a, a an end point or connect to something else. You, when you said the collector standards, is that a separate Girdwood collector standard? No, or it's the municipality of Anchorage. I thought there were rural collectors and uh, urban collectors. Um, there are commercial collectors and industrial collectors, and this is, an, I think, being considered an industrial collector. And then through... Uh, is it on the OSNHP? Yes. As an industrial collector? Yes. Oh. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, Mr. Spring? Um, for our spare time, what are they going to... Is this parking going to be timed out, or is it just open parking? Is it limited to 12 hours a day, 24 hours a day? There, there is no limit on the parking time. Um, while there will be 15 paved official parking spaces, um, the shoulders would be such that it, if people, if there was an overage of parking, they could probably, for one day a year, for a, a large event like Forest Fair, park um, at the side of the road. Well, knowing that the people charge for parking, there'll be a, a strong impetus to close that road so that you have to pay for parking down there. And um, I have a problem put building parking spaces and then, then not letting people use them. My recommendation would be a two-hour limit on the parking spaces so that they could provide a use. I don't know who would enforce parking in Girdwood right now. Um, the multi-use trail that goes nowhere really bothers me, as does the simple fact that we are trying to provide 22 lineal foot or 22 feet of travel, and we take 80 feet to provide for two travel lanes. This appears to be well, how much land can we take? Let's fill it up, as opposed to looking at what is the minimum we can do. We have a snow storage landscape buffer, a sidewalk, a gutter, a paved shoulder, 11 foot travel, 11 foot travel, three and a half foot paved shoulder or nine foot parking lane, five and a half foot vegetated shoulder over a two foot gravel, a nine-foot swale snow storage, a two-foot shoulder, an eight-foot multi-use pathway, a two-foot shoulder, a 6.5 to 8.5 snow storage landscape buffer. I don't know if there was anything left in the manual that they didn't throw in this thing. Um, I am, I, I just, it, it's awfully, awfully broad to get 22 feet of traffic in there. And um, I don't like the fact that the multi-use trail doesn't go anywhere, um, that the parking, I mean, if you wanted to throw traffic calming, you could throw some medians in there or some, or some planning in there that would, would do more than what you've done um, on that. Mr. Spring. Yeah, interesting you brought that up. I. I I think eventually the multi-use trail will go somewhere, but I'm not sure. I think it might be, I kind of agree that maybe it's a little bit overkill in the design, but um, it seems like the multi-use trail could be on the side of where the activity is, uh, the library and the community center, and which is where the people are going to be going to. That's the destination. So you think you'd want to have so you're going to have kids probably riding their bikes maybe to the library. 
and they're not going to take the multi-use trail on the other side because they have to go over the uh, swale, like um, Mr. Robinson said, and then cross the street. What they're going to do is probably go on the sidewalk on the other side. And of course, well, there probably won't be a whole lot of pedestrian bicycle conflicts, but the idea of a multi-use trail is to be wide enough to accommodate both pedestrians and bicyclists. And it seems like if I was looking at it, I would probably prefer to see the multi-use trail on the other side and maybe question whether there's a need for a sidewalk on the other side. If, if I can speak to sure. that, um, a lot of the multi-use trail and it being developed on the west side is kind of the more organic trail is, is being driven through the community's desires. In addition to that, they've actually asked us to use the full 80 feet so that they can can have all the amenities. So um, it, we actually, and when we came to you with the concept report, had a scaled back version. And then in, in meeting with them, they've said, no, use the full 80 feet because we, we want to have these amenities. So it is being driven through the community input that we've received. And I, and I know that the 19 foot shoulder probably seems excessive. Okay, we have no public hearing. Do we have a motion on this context sensitive design? Mr. Robinson. Yeah, I move that in the matter of case 2015-0086 draft design study report for Egloff Drive improvements that we forward uh, the Department of Recommendations uh, with the addition on the resolve sentence to include input from the Girdwood Board of Supervisors um, on the trail lighting issue. Okay. Do we have a second for that motion? Thank you, Mr. Cange. Do we have any further discussion? Any discussion at all? Please use your machines. That motion passed. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, uh, can we make um, some uh, findings? Please do. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like just to I think I based my uh, yes vote on the fact that there was a good public process and community involvement. And I feel reluctant to make any recommendations for any changes uh, based on our, you know, 15 minutes of fame here on the podium. And uh, especially when there's been, it looks like a pretty good public process. I, I might have some disagreements about their, their, their concepts, but I wouldn't want to override that in the Planning Zoning Commission right now. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Any other comments? Thank you very much. That completes that case. The next case before us is case 2015-0084, request to rezone lots 4, 5, and 6, Block 8, Northern Light Subdivision. Before we start this, could the applicant or the applicant's representative step forward, please? Mr. Sawhill, does your applicant understand the short board nature we're under tonight? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and we would like to go forward tonight. Thank you very much. We will go to staff and then we will come back to you. Staff, do we have a report on this case? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, this case is a request to rezone lots four, five, and six Block 8 Northern Light Subdivision from R4 Multifamily Residential to RO Residential Office District and, um, and Residential Office District to ROSL, which is a residential office with special limitations. The property is located south of West Benson and east of Dawson Street. Um, the property is surrounded to the north, northeast, and northwest. Um, by commercial uses that front onto Benson Boulevard, which are zoned B3. And um, they're developed with commercial uses as mentioned. Property to the east is developed with single and two family residential uses. Uh, single family residential development is located to the south. Property to the west is a mix of two family dwellings, apartment buildings, and um, a series of vacant lots. The proposal is to combine the three lots into two lots. A 15-foot right-of-way dedication will be required for the east half of Dawson Street to meet the current standards for an urban, um, urban street standards. 
um, mixed use development is proposed consisting of an office building and six residential units consisting of two two bedroom units and four one bedroom units. In reviewing this request, um, the rezoning will allow the redevelopment of underutilized land in Midtown. The housing study that was prepared found that there is a shortage of entry level housing that's served by public services in close proximity to employment centers and public transportation routes. Um, office space and six rental units will be developed in this um, is uh, this is consistent with the housing study and the comprehensive plan. The proposal is consistent with the following policies of Anchorage 2020, policy 10. Um, mixed use development is encouraged in a major employment centers, mixed use redevelopment areas, town centers and neighborhood centers. Um, the petition site is a is identified as a mixed use development um, area, major employment center, and a mixed use redevelopment area. It's consistent with uh, policy 15 to conserve residential lands for residential, for housing in a high, commu is a high community opportunity and priority. It also is consistent with policy 20, uh, medium and high density residential development as well as commercial mixed use is encouraged in aging and underutilized area. And this is a redevelopment area on, um, identified in Anchorage 2020. Uh, the RO district is intended to provide areas for professional business and medical service uses, as well as areas with compatible mix of office and residential uses. And this proposal is consistent with that. Um, the RO district regulations or intent. Uh, the proposed development will provide a somewhat low intensity transition between the commercial uses along Benson Boulevard and the single family residential uses to the south. Neither the office building nor the apartment building will exceed two stories in height. Um, the petition site is served by all public services as well as utilities. The uses to be developed under the proposed ROSL district will not result in significant adverse impacts upon the environment or adjacent uses. The rezone conforms to the policies of the comprehensive plan, is consistent with the intent of the RO zoning district. It provides entry level housing at a density of 17 dwelling units per acre in close proximity to a major employment center and public transportation routes. Um, the uh, department does recommend approval subject to the two special limitations on page 10 of the report, which state um, a mix of six dwelling units shall be developed on the proper, a minimum of six dwelling units shall be developed on the property and non-residential development on the property shall not be issued a conditional certificate of occupancy or a certificate of occupancy prior to the residential development being issued a conditional certificate of occupancy or a certificate of occupancy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Spring, then Commissioner uh, Kange. Uh, yes. Uh, can you uh, tell me what the the differences between the ordinance that we found in the petitioner's packet and the recommendations, uh, special limitations that staff made. Um. The staff, um, just for instance, I mean, you, as recommended that the minimum six dwelling units shall be developed on the property and non-residential development of the property shall not be issued a conditional use certificate of occupancy prior to the residential development being issued a conditional certificate of occupancy and the ordinance which I am assuming was prepared by the petitioner and would be submitted to the assembly I don't know uh, says that the special limitation the southern 75 feet of the property shall be developed as multifamily use with a minimum six dwelling units uh, through the chair Mr. Spring um, through the department review the um, Second condition, uh, I understand, was added to ensure that the uh, six residential units would actually be developed 
uh, prior to or with the office use. And uh, it's the, through the chair, and staff prefers that to the special limitation that the petitioner proposed, which seems like it would require that south 75 feet would have to be developed as residential, or they have to come back and change the special limitation, right? Um, through the chair, um, Mr. Spring, as the condition was originally written, the the, um, when it's going to be platted, the lots will be slightly irregular. And so as the condition was originally written, it was proposed lot one would be the northern lot, proposed lot two would be the southern lot. And because they're irregular, they're not absolutely square, um, the south 75 feet was a little, a um, little bit too broad, so as the condition was originally written, it was that um, proposed lot two shall be developed with six residential units. And um, the, uh, as I said, through the review within the department, the, um, the recommended condition, conditions were amended and added to. And if I may, Mr. Chair, just follow up. Um, you, you mentioned in your comments that um, the development would only be two stories and that there'd be a landscape buffer. Now, there's nothing in special limitations that would require that. It, we could see that from the concept that it might happen, but there really, in reality, is there any way to enforce that if um, they decided to do something different? Um, through the chair, Mr. Spring, you're quite correct that that was not included as a special limitation. Okay, thank so, you. barring a special limitation, um, if uh, situations changed, um, it could possibly not happen. Is is the landscape? Sorry, through the chair, is the landscaping on the southern part of the property would be required regardless? Uh, in <laughs> due to the regulations, or would, that wouldn't require special limitations to enforce that, would it? Would, does that meet the regulations, not currently, landscape requirements? Um, through the chair, um, According to the new code, the um, RO adjacent to R2A would require L2 buffer landscaping. Okay, thank you. Under the new code standards. Which is uh, eight feet? F 15 feet. 15 feet, okay. Okay, thank you. Are you done, Mr. Spring? Mr. Cange. Thank you, through the chair. Maybe if you can walk me through this condition or recommendation number two again. I'm, I'm not sure I'm following. I, I guess what's the logic in saying that we can't have um, commercial in there without this residential being built when we have a recommendation for number one that says a minimum of six units will be built on the property anyway? Um, through the chair, I believe it's a matter of timing that the, um, the way it's written is that the residential development should be undertaken at, at least prior, prior to or at least at the, at the same time as the commercial development would be undertaken. Yeah. And so that the office or the commercial use could not be constructed and completed and issued a, a certificate of occupancy prior to the residential units obtaining a certificate of occupancy. So I, I understand your logic in that now. Uh, frankly, um, I have to disagree with that logic and I think that we have to let the markets decide you know, what gets built first based on maybe commitments with leases or um, advanced sales of the residential, and so I, I just can't support that recommendation 
um, just because it's you, we want residential before we want commercial without any real logic behind it. Unless, the, unless that's something the petitioner really wanted in their packet, but uh, you know, again, I, I just don't, I can't buy into that theory. That's all, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cage. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Two points, yeah, I would just echo that last one. I'm not sure it's even legal. I would recommend that the, the municipal attorney, I mean, I, I can see conditioning something from a st timing standpoint if it's necessary to support the development proposed but I frankly don't even see the legality um, of requiring residential on a lot that has potentially nothing to do. And as, if I look at the site plan, the thing that I would require would be to ensure that the, you know, the access to the, to the extent that if it is platted into two and it's provided, it's a shared access, but that, that whole access has to be provided. But I think we're getting ahead of ourselves on a, on a rezoning. Um, I think my, my question, if, if I could get staff and the commission to look at page 12 in the packet, it shows the zoning map in the area. And I, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to understand kind of where we're headed in this part of the community. Uh, clearly there's a pretty sizable mobile home park that's in the area that I think, if you've been through there, I think is likely to be redeveloped at some point in the coming years. Um, but it strikes me that at some point there is this transition from more commercial to residential within this area. I think it's important to really maintain residential in these core blocks within the Midtown area. Um, I'm glad that the petitioner has proposed doing it on, on this particular property, but I'm just wondering if I can get staff's perspective. You know, if I look at West 30th and kind of think, well, is that, is that the natural break between, you know, more commercial type development and the rest, you know, or, or where is it? Does it just sort of eat in block, <laughs> lot, lot and lot at a time or parcel at a time? I wondered if you can comment on how that fits with the municipality's kind of long-term vision for this particular area, given that we don't yet have a, an actual land use plan map that, that tells us what it ought to do. Um, through the chair, um, Mr. Mr. Robinson, I, um, I basically looked at the properties and there is a mix, there really is a mix and um, of uses and between between um, Chichaco and basically um, Eureka, there seemed to be a substantial amount of the original development, which seemed to be residential in neighbor. This is a 1946 plat. They had 15 foot wide rights of way. And there, some of, there are some apartment buildings there's even one apartment building that's a historic building. And then there are interspersed, like directly west, there is a series of vacant lots. I don't know what's gonna happen to that, those lots. I don't know if commercial is going to, you know, creep down. But what I found very interesting when I was keeping track of the residential lots, that the homes, although they were built starting in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, numbers of them have been remodeled. I think it would be really difficult, and I came to the conclusion that it would be really difficult in this neighborhood that has existed for uh, 60 years to assemble large parcels that you could develop high density residential. I don't really, I couldn't find out when that trailer court actually, I couldn't find a date on that trailer court. I didn't know when that developed. And there's also a park. The park serves a large residential area. And there, there are apartment buildings, but they're not large apartment buildings. They might have eight units in it. So it's a very interesting, well-maintained neighborhood with a lot of natural vegetation. So it's, it's hard to predict what will happen here, but I really think that it's gonna be difficult to assemble large pieces of, large parcels to do a big development. I think that there's a lot of homes here that probably still have a, a lot of um, life in them, so to speak. And uh, 
the the proposal that has been brought forward with this request for um, for uh, a rezone, it seems that the office space is just adjoining B3 zoning. But it's not B3 zoning. It's a much less intense RO zoning, and it's an office space um, that's only two stories high. And then you have you have a center air center area for amenities, um, parking, landscaping, um, access, and turning and maneuvering. And then you have residential units that are. Um, they're not single family, but they're, they're residential nonetheless. And it's not really that many units that would be overwhelmingly tall, casting shadows on, on some of the, the residential units to the south. So I do know that there, it's a change for the two, for the immediately surrounding residential units in that there might be windows, um, you know, looking into, looking down on um, these homes and perhaps that's not desirable for a long-term resident, but I, I really think that I came to the conclusion when I, I was looking at all the different uses and how many were remodeled and that, you know, this is, this is a resident, primarily a residential area between Chichaco and Eureka. No, thank you. And, and I guess the, the, just to follow up and I'll ask the petitioner the same thing, but, but why, why, what's the rationale for the lot to the south uh, even being RO and just not R4? I mean, they can clearly do, they can, they can do a sixplex on an R4 parcel, I, I presume. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Robinson, that's true. And is it is it just a timing issue related to when the plat is going to come through, or, or what's the what's the issue? I, and I and I can defer, but you don't have an uh, you, you agree with RO, but but the staff didn't didn't mind it going RO. But I, I'll ask the petitioner. That's fine. We'll follow I, up. I I actually I don't know why they chose the RO, other than that um, there. I didn't realize at the time that it, at the time when we had the joint division, I mean, when we met with the petitioner, that there was a plat associated with this, and so it could have something to do with the division of the land, the future division of the land. Thank you. Okay, before I call, any other questions for staff? Before I call the petitioner, I'll remind everybody that we have time limits for public hearing. Petitioners, including all of his or her representatives, get 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved by rebuttal. Representatives of groups, community council, PTAs get five minutes. Individuals get three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An individual may have appeal rights relating to any action planning and zoning takes, except the commission's recommendations to the assembly, which are not appealable. Appeals must be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission of the resolution, which is the commission's final decision. A fee for the appeal is required at the time of filing. Mr. Sawhill, will you step up and state your name and spell it for the record, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jim Sawhill, S-A-W-H-I-L-L. I'm with Lounsbury and Associates and here tonight to represent CY Investments and the request uh, to rezone the property. Um, also with me tonight is Tara Gallagher, the project architect. If you have any specific questions on the design or the architectural uh, style that we're using, she'll be available to answer those questions. Um, the request tonight is to rezone three lots. They're 50 foot wide lots. The northern lot is currently zoned RO, and the southern two lots is zoned R4. And we would like to rezone the entire parcel to ROSL, and I'll get into the reasons for that in a minute. And uh, the existing situation is we have one single family structure 
on the southern two lots and the northern lot, the RO lot, is currently vacant. And what we would, what we're really doing is looking at is, is an infill development. Um, we've assembled three lots and we're in the, you know, midtown area, um, in the area called for uh, mixed use development and high density residential to support the, the core area, the midtown area. And, and our multi-use development that we're proposing is in line with the goals and policies of the comp plan. Um, it actually matches it amazingly well. Um, it is a difficult proposal for the neighborhood. Um, change in the neighborhood is a difficult thing. Um, it's an older neighborhood and seeing it redevelop into more intensive use regardless of the use is concerning to those neighbors. Um, again, our proposal is for a mixed use residential office development um, through the special limitation requiring six dwelling units we are maintaining the theoretical density of the southern two R4 lots. So there won't be any loss of zoning or loss of residential density or units through the rezone because of the special limitations. Um, our development allows for a transition from commercial to residential through our development, um, which is one of the goals of the comprehensive plan and allows for transitional zoning to occur. The buffer on the southern end of the property is a, a 10 foot buffer, which is required by the, the, the new Title 21. And one of the reasons we've rezoned the entire parcel to ROSL is to move that buffer to the southern end adjacent to the existing R4. If we maintain those, the southern lot is R4, then the buffer would essentially be at our, our property line, which would be our common access and would uh, reduce the amount of density we could uh, accomplish on the project in a unified design. Um, the area to the south is zoned R4, which is a medium density multifamily residential district. Um, this area is a, a, a mix of existing uses from single family to apartments to trailers. Um, it is an area in transition and uh, the transition to multifamily is concerning to the neighborhood and is uh, going to be difficult um, for that area. You know, change is always difficult when you have older residents that have been there a long time. Um, but that, when you look at the comprehensive plan, that large block of R4 is important to the Midtown Business uh, District in having high density residential um, adjacent to the high employment areas. The, the project uh, will have a replat component that will follow up. Um, we will be creating two lots. Um, we will be dedicating 15 feet of right of way. Uh, we anticipate a requirement to widen the road, uh, construct a sidewalk on our side. Um, we are working with the neighbor to the north so we can continue the sidewalk all the way to Benson. There's currently a sidewalk on Dawson south of us and that will make a nice pedestrian connection and a good connection to the transit facilities in Benson. Um, the southern lot will require, will be required to uh, be developed as residential with a minimum of six dwelling units. That's an important special limitation and one we agree with. Um, on the conditions of approval, um, we have no objection to condition one. We would request that condition two be removed. Um, we. In my experience, it's, it's a pretty unusual condition. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Um, we don't think it's an appropriate for a land use restriction. Um, I think it is our intent to build these simultaneously. I think it's gonna be a lost cost savings for us to build those simultaneously, but there could be some issues that develop that might delay the residential. Um, right now, the market's a little, little sketchy um, with oil prices down. Um, financing for residential is different. Um, financing for an owner-occupied office is pretty readily available. Um, we just don't feel that that's an appropriate land use restriction and would like to get it removed. Um, with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Mr. Cage. Thank you, uh, through the chair. When we talk about a minimum of six dwelling units, do you anticipate um, doing anything greater than that? because of the concern of the residents of going too dense? 
Our original proposal was to uh, put four residential units on that. And in our meetings with staff, going through the rezone and our site planning, um, staff was very insistent that we have a minimum of six dwelling units. Personally, I preferred the design with four dwelling units. We had more open space available, um, but we agreed um, that we would put that special limitation to have a minimum of six. Okay, thank you. Mr. Spring? Uh, yes, a number of things. Um, first of all, I appreciate uh, sending the summary of the meeting with the community. I don't know if that was a community council meeting or as a separate meeting with the It was a separate meeting. I found it very useful to have it. The Thank issues you. delineated. I wish there more people would do that. That was good. And one of the things that came up I noticed was uh, talk about the drainage um, mm -hmm. affecting the surrounding property. I wonder if you could comment on that and tell us what they Sure. Do. What we heard at the public meeting is there's, there's drainage issues there are several drainage issues in the area. One is the uh, alleyway. The alleyway currently doesn't drain well. Um, it's not plowed consistently in the winter, um, so there's drainage issues there. Um, I also think there's some drainage coming across our property over to Dawson Street. But with the development uh, of this, this property, um, we will be extending the storm drain from Benson Boulevard um, south on Dawson to our property and we'll have a, a, a storm drain system on site um, to handle our drainage. Um, we anticipate a requirement to pave the alley as, as part of this uh, peripheral improvements. So adjacent to us on, on both streets in the alley out in Dawson, um, we'll be able to solve any of the drainage issues that, that are associated with this property. Um, follow-up question to the chair um, what's the condition of Dawson Street currently is it um, I, I'm assuming it's kind of substandard uh, um, Dawson Street south of us is uh, a fully developed road um, to municipal standards with a sidewalk on the the I guess it would be east side um, adjacent to our property it's a it's a narrow road it's 24 feet wide um, it does have curb and gutter on both sides um, which surprised me. I thought it was strip paved initially. Um, but we anticipate having half street improvements on our side. Um, so we'll extend it to the full width on our side, which should, should be, the total road width should be 33 feet. So we'll go 16 and a half on our side, plus we'll have the sidewalk. And you'll, you'll build the sidewalk? Yes. But the sidewalk won't and be lighting. connected to... There's a gap then in the sidewalk between this property and Benson. Because right, the, the sidewalk dead ends on our south boundary. And so we will extend it up to our north boundary. And then we have one lot between us and Benson. And um, the, the person, we've talked to the, the person that owns that property, the, uh, I call it the old land tech building, so everyone recognizes where it's at. And, uh, but they're, to be real honest, they're, they're parking in the right of way where we would like to build the sidewalk. Um, so they were open to discussing it, but they wanted to see if there was going to be impacts to their parking. Mm. There's sufficient right of way, uh, same right of way with currently in the no north of the yours. So is there a need for additional right of way there to build a sidewalk? I'm trying to recall. Uh, this is getting off topic though, I think. But, um, um, no, it's a narrow right away up there too. It's up there too, so they'd have to probably. Yeah. Well, it, it looks like to me that the existing RO property is one lot and it's 50 feet. I think I'm a little. I'm sympathetic for the rezone, and I think as much that it would be very difficult to develop an office on 50 foot wide lot. It would be. And, Effectively, what we're rezoning is 25 feet um, to allow the additional parking. So we're effectively rezoning half of that middle lot to allow a, a residential office development and then maintaining the residential on the southern portion. And just one more question then. I, I personally like the conditional uh, um, condition of approval in the ordinance, the 75 feet. I think that is better than eliminating the second conditional use and just using the one, the the number one conditional or um, special limitation that staff is recommending, which just says you'll build six multifamily. 
It, and, and it doesn't we, specify uh, where. Doesn't I think it's important that that be on the south part of our development. I did too. Yeah. You know, I think the, the staff proposed conditions pretty generic and we can make that work. We just need to do six units. So, um, but the original condition in the ordinance we proposed is, is basically what we want. I understand what, what Ms. O'Brien is saying in that our lot isn't exactly 75 feet wide. I think it's 74.8 or something, but it's our intention that the southern lot be developed as residential, be limited to residential, and be developed at a minimum of six dwelling units. You done, Mr. Spring? Mr. Robinson? Thanks. I presume you don't want to tie a site plan to any kind of special limitation. Is that, a, is that true? Um, we would prefer not to. I think in this case, the, the, uh, the new code deals sufficiently with site design issues um, that, that this is a project specific reason. We have brought you what we want to yeah, do. No, I, and, that, that's for, and clearly that's how it works. I mean, the issue that I had was as you show it, the access that comes between the two parcels only works if there's cooperation between those two parcels. Right. Clearly there is now, but I was trying to envision some scenario where you build it. You know, clearly if you were to build it and not have that access, be able to access the, the call it the residential lot. Mm -hmm. My guess is it becomes a lot more challenging to get six units on that. We would parcel. never get six units on that without. Even so, fighting. so I don't want to create a situation mm -hmm. where, and I get staff saying condition it on timing, and I think some of us are uncomfortable with that. But I, I'd hate to get into a situation where you have to build six, but through development, the access is a little different, and you, the lot gets sold off, and suddenly you get this lot where it's impossible to get the maneuvering that you need on there. So I don't know if you have any suggestions or can alleviate our concerns or my concerns with that. But again, I, it works. It's a creative way to get six. It's hard to get six units on a small lot. I like how you've done it, but but by not tying you to this, there's you know I could see it going backwards a little bit. I, I think economics will tie us to that. Okay, Mr. Sawhill, you have four and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I will now open up this to the public hearing. If you wish to speak, step forward, state your name, and spell it for the record, please. My name is Cindy Stoltenberg. The last name is S-T-O-L-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. I reside directly across from the current residential unit on that lot, and I've lived there about 30 years. I'm very concerned with the plan that they have going forward because I don't think it takes reality into consideration. It all looks very nice on paper, but even their rendering of what the new office building will look like is slightly skewed. The lots that are there now are on two levels. So they're either going to have to remove quite a bit of fill material in order to make those two the same. We have two problems in that area right now. Homelessness. The new design for the building is only missing a banner that says, come in here to get out of the weather. We also had a major drug bust on our street this summer. So we're not talking about easy things to accomplish. One of the things that I think needs to be done is to talk to the neighborhood patrol people. Uh, most of us in that area have been in contact with them all summer long because right behind the, the building that I occupy are the vacant lots. Now you can see how successful businesses have been in the area just by looking at the Northern Lights Hotel. The only business to develop in that area in the past 30 years is Carl's Jr. So this has not been a place um, where there's been a lot of interest. I believe that having six apartments in that particular spot along with the office building puts way too much traffic into that particular area on Dawson Street. 
The street of 30th is not wide. It's just a small secondary. Okay, so there is no parking on 30th unless they park in my yard. So a lot of the residents of the area are talking about no parking signs and no trespassing signs because we have no other way to protect ourselves. We have a lot of children who play in that area. What do we do with the children? Who's going to be watching out for them? There are just two, on paper it looks fabulous. You know, it's easy, it's, is that my, Okay, fine. Any questions? Just questions for you. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony, ma'am. Okay. Good evening. Susan Kiley, K I E L Y. I own property um, just to the south of the building, uh, the proposed building. My biggest concern is, is the parking because it says in their paper there's room for 20 employees in this building and then six apartments. I still don't know how many parking spaces there are. That's one of my biggest concerns besides the traffic flow because if you have 20 people in six apartments, that's at least probably 32 cars that are going to come and go and they say, oh well, the people are mostly in the field or the people in the apartments work during the day, but that's the best case scenario. Otherwise, it's parking on the street. And where they're going to um, widen the street, where the commercial property is now, the land tech building, as they refer to it, they're going to take out two of the parking places in that lot. And those people park on the street now as it is. So that's a, that's a big issue, that and the uh, traffic in the alley. It's, it's, there's a sign in there that says no through traffic, but people come and go through there constantly and the road gets rutted. And I think somebody else is going to speak to that directly. But my biggest concern is the parking and the traffic going through the alley. So thank you. Thank you. Question? Can, Hold on. Can, can you just, can you tell me um, how, how the alley, is the alley utilized by the, the residences in the area? Yeah, because some of their garages go in and out of the alley. And as it is now, you can just, in the morning, like when people are coming and going and leaving, people start going down the alley and then they have to back out because somebody's coming the other way. And at our initial meeting that we had, I had suggested, well, maybe they could make the alley one way because I'm not you know, against development at all, but I just, I've lived in the neighborhood as well for 30 years, and I want to stay there, but it has to be livable. So anyway, I suggested, you know, maybe that would be a solution to make the traffic feed out onto Benson rather than, you know, coming through the neighborhoods. Because as things have developed around there, it's, it is, everybody cuts through from Arctic to sea, from 36 to to Benson, so if we could just mitigate some of that traffic with new development, that would be nice. Does, does the trash pick up on the alley? No. Well, our, I don't, not mine, so I don't, I don't know. Particular yeah. You don't know? I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. I met other mystery person, Mary Kiley, K-I-E-L-Y, her sister, and we actually own two pieces of property there. We have a duplex and a single, single family dwelling, and I, I'm kind of new to this. I don't know if you folks can see my picture of the alley right out. If Can I give it to someone or show it? Testify, why don't you bring it up here? We'll okay, great. I have a few photographs. Um, like my sister said, one of our main concerns is, I, I think it's a great idea, but the traffic through the alley, um, oh, I don't know, maybe... I can't even tell you how many years ago they put the bank in across from the land tech building and in order to do that they we all voted and agreed that they would shut Eureka off so that it didn't go through. Well, one of the things that's happened is that is again an area for homeless people and there's mattresses, there's sex, there's drugs, <laughs> rock and roll, everything. So what we're trying to do is not have the traffic through the alley, and we would like that it would be maintained. Um, there's really huge potholes. 
Um, part of the problem is, is all summer they've been doing the reconstruction project on 32nd. So we've had detours down our road the entire summer and the project isn't slated to be actually completed until 11:10, which I'm assuming they're gonna run out of asphalt here shortly. Um, they don't maintain that alley. There is uh, probably three dumpsters that pick up. Another one of my concerns besides the parking is the fact that people will go in and out of this business through the alley and they're gonna like quadruple the flow through it. So not only is it gonna be hard on the alley, an unpaved road, but there is no drainage. The Project 80's money stopped on Dawson and it stopped on uh, Ide. So if you go that way, we're like exactly in the middle of where the Project 80 stopped with drainage. So the whole street on 31st between those two roads, there is no drainage to be hooked into. And I, I realized that at their end of the alley that it, and I heard that part of it was fire code, you know, that they needed to be able to get the fire trucks down there. A simple gate would work there. One of the other uh, places in town that had a similar issue was uh, Culver and 23rd. And what they did is on the end of Culver over there by West High, they closed off the access to Culver and 23rd and kept the traffic on to 25th. And that would be one thing that I would like to see done is keep the traffic out of the alley and then have some way to keep up with any off street parking because that road narrows if you, okay. <laughs> We've got a question, so hang, hang tight. Mr. Cange. Thank you, ma'am, through the chair. You know, I, I understand uh, in looking at the, the initial design, you know, the parking concerns and the alleyway designs and, and although I've got some concerns about snow storage and parking myself, what we're really here for is not to determine what that plat and the, and the notes on that plat might ultimately look like. Um, so that's something that the platting board does once and if this is uh, approved. I would continue or just make a suggestion is to continue with your efforts to discuss parking, uh, traffic flow, um, at, the, at the next level, the platting level. Okay, so LV told me to come here. No, so. I, 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 I appreciate you coming out and, and voicing those concerns because they are important and um, you know, in this particular area, I, with you and your sister, uh, I, I see those concerns. I work just down the road uh, from this location. So I think the petitioner has some big hurdles there once it gets to that step, but I appreciate you coming out and voicing those concerns. And so also I have, I'm probably out of line here, but one of the other neighbors asked, he had to leave the country and he asked me if I could drop his off, so. Okay, bring, bring that up also. Okay, thank you. We'll take that up. The next person, please come up and testify. Pam, come on down. My name is Evelyn Ball. Miss Ball, e you pull the mic down? Yeah. There, thank you. Now we can hear you better. Okay. My name is Evelyn Ball. I'm 79 years old. My name's spelled B-A-L-L. -L. I lived next door to the property for 54 years. And my concern is my privacy with the way the sixplex sits and it's two stories. You'll be able to look right down into my living room and on the other side facing the alley is my reading nook and a TV that will also be visible. And I'd like a maximum height solid wood fence between our properties. And I want to know if there'll be lighting on the side of the building on my side, the south side. And will there be a fence built between properties while construction's going on? And if they know the start date and the completion date. And can we get copies of all the minutes and the proposals? And I feel like planning and zoning, I hope they've gone and looked at the property, not just on paper. Thank you. Don't run off, Mr. Spring. 
Yes, uh, so your property is just to the south, the single family house? Yes. That's just to the south, and what's, what's the distance between your um, house and the property line? I think mine's 10 foot and theirs is 10 foot. And theirs is 10 foot. And your entrance, see there's windows there on that side? Yes. Where, in your living room? Face in that my side. living room, and then the alley, there's like a round nook. So you're asking for a fence along there, would yes. be, I think, I don't know what the typical fence would be. There's no requirement for a fence in the regulations, so it'd be a 10-foot buffer, which a landscape buffer is what I'm hearing. A uh, fence would have to be required, I think, separately, but would a six-foot fence were, be helpful, or would that, the two-story building, they would still look? Well, I would still like to have a fence. But a, a solid wood fence. A solid wood fence would be helpful and yes. help to prevent the, uh, people looking into your living room. No, <laughs> it won't help that. Oh, but it would give you some sense of privacy. Yes. Somewhat, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are you done, Mr. Spring? Mr. Robinson. Thank you, and thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar, are you aware of when the property became zoned R4? I think it was R4 when we built our house in 61. It was already in 61. It was already R4. Yes. And you, and you are, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you are, but you are aware, even though there, there are single-family homes in the neighborhood, someone, oh, yes. that, that, that someone could build multifamily today and I we wouldn't be having that. any of this conversation. I know that. Okay. And I, and I get it, and I, and I understand why you're here and why you share those concerns. It's one of those very challenging issues where the land use pattern that exists doesn't match the zoning that exists and that's you know that's we, we see that often in Anchorage I realize that thank you any further questions thank you for your testimony miss ball <laughs> notice we have all women tonight testifying so far hi I'm Anna Finley I'm one of those very old people that the petitioner was talking about um, I, I just wanted to make note because when I when staff was talking um, she was talking about all the all the multi-use or the, the multiplexes and the apartment buildings and all of that and I realized we are zoned R4 and you know my husband and I have tossed around the thought of you know when we move on to another place you know we could do that to our property as well because we realize it is something we can do with that area but this actual street we are talking about and the next street over it's not prevalent here so what he's asking for and what he wants to do to this area is not what we're ta what's here so we're looking at a whole street of single family homes with one fourplex on it and the next street over a whole street of single family homes with one apartment building on it and then he wants to plop down a sixplex and an office building in it and so while staff is saying yes this fits in you know this is what i'm seeing in the area she's not looking at our area she's looking blocks away when she's saying yes there's apartment buildings and yes there's eight plexes and yes there's six plexes this is not what we see as our neighborhood and um and when you were talking about in the notes about how whatever house it was that it drains into the garage you know that's my garage and i know that's what you mentioned that you're not here to listen to but it that is our biggest concern is our alleyway and when he said that he's going to pave the alley the last thing we heard from him is that he's going to pave it to the end of his lot so while that might not be your concern that's our biggest concern as a group because that's what we have to live off of and that's what all our driveways go on to is the alleyway and because you're the only people we have to talk to and because these people don't want to listen to us we're just going to keep standing here and talking to you because we're not getting any communication from these people other than that one meeting and they included the notes to you guys and made it seem like they're talking to us and communicating 
and they got our email addresses and said, this is going to be how it's gonna be. We're gonna be talking, everything's gonna be nice. But that's the only communication we've had. So because we're standing here in front of you and you're the people that have said we get to have a public hearing and you get to talk to us, then we're gonna tell you about our alley and our parking, even if you're not the right people because <laughs> that's what we got. So thank you. Don't run off, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, I just, I, I, do you know how we get to this six unit thing on a site plan? Do you know where that comes from? What do you mean? Well, it's, it's a staff recommendation in this case. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually not necessarily being proposed by the person doing the project. And, and do you, in a, in a weird way, you, in what's driving the six units is is this this kind of comprehensive plan that says that there ought to be high density housing here, right? Correct. And you heard the petitioner say, "Well, we would have rather done a four than four, because who wants to live in a 500 square foot unit?" Well, <laughs> I think a lot of people, not me. I know one, a lot of people need to. I mean, that's yeah. another issue. But I guess my my to, to the to the point of of whether or not when you think about the right development on an R4 lot that exists there in this neighborhood today, what does it look like? Is someone gonna build a brand new single family home in the neighborhood? I mean, to us it would be leaving that beautiful old house that's already there. But, you know, he couldn't sell that house. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, I'm trying to reconcile, again, this mismatch that we have. So we have these competing interests, and on the one hand, we're driving, we're, we're actually creating a minimum number of units here. Mm -hmm. That's the recommendation. It doesn't have to be, that's, that's on the table here tonight. So while we can't talk about paving alleys and things like that, that's sort of one of the things that we're here to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to testify? Hi, my name is Jesse Gotchall. Last name Golf Oscar Sierra. I'm sorry, G O T S C H A L L. Uh, I own 3002 Eureka Street, and uh, I actually just have a question. I heard six units was the minimum. The, the, right. That was the minimum according to the staff recommendation. That is perfect. I will be putting in a proposal to put eight in on my lot. Thanks. Any further testimony? Any further testimony on case 2015-0084? Going once, going twice. Mr. Sawhill, you have four and a half minutes. Or your, anyone on your side. Mr. Chairman, again, my name is Jim Sawhill. Um, we heard through the public uh, testimony several issues I'd like to address. Um, first is there's um, some grading issues uh, across the site. Um, we do recognize there's about five feet of fall from north to south. Um, there will be some, some grading that needs to occur and, and possibly some low retaining walls to make everything fit. Um, but we don't imagine any, any problems there. Mm -hmm. Um, at our public meeting, we did hear about the homeless issue in the area, and, and that is a problem. I think most people are, are, are aware of where Dwell Realty's current offices are on C Street, just a little bit south of here, about 3200 C Street. They have similar issues there. Um, one of the things they've done at that location is hired private security to drop by the site a couple times a night to make sure that there's no homeless uh, staying in the area of their commercial development and their intent is to do the same thing here. So there will be um, additional oversight for homeless uh, in this area related to the commercial building. Um, the, the six units or less that may be required on the, the southern lot, um, it is intended that those be uh, condominium units. So there will be owner occupied units. Um, and so having the owner occupied units provides a higher level of, of surveillance 
and we think that will also help with the quality of the development and uh, uh, managing the homeless issue. Um, traffic is an issue we're here at the public meeting uh, and at, at tonight's meeting and whenever we increase uh, development we do have additional traffic. Um, again, if we just developed it under the current underlying zoning, we will have a more intense development and have more traffic. Um, one of the things we talked about at our public meeting is the possibility of signing the alley one way. Uh, we're willing to talk to the municipality about that. Um, it really is going to come down to fire, um, whether fire currently uses the alley as access and whether they would, would require two way. Um, but it's definitely a, a subject or we're willing to, to take further with the city. Um, the, uh, the issue of, of uh, Evelyn, who lives to the south of us, and, and her privacy, uh, we intend to build a six-foot high wood fence and have no problem with additional condition if, if the uh, commission deems that appropriate. Um, we have provided Evelyn with, with the elevations that show the window locations and, and looked at them um, on the page numbers aren't in the back of the, the packet. The, the south elevation is shown. Um, the, the primary windows on the second story that will look down on her are, are, are towards the middle of the building. Um, and there's no windows in the middle of her building. Her biggest issue is on the front and the back, especially the back. She has a wonderful space in the back. Um, and I can understand her concern over uh, people looking down at her at that location. Um, and in that area, um, the one window that's there is uh, the first level window, um, not the second level window. So, so by coincidence, our design worked out okay for her situation. Not ideal. Again, I understand not wanting a two-story building. But again, when the current zoning of R4 for that lot immediately north of her, something larger, something probably two-story will be built there. Um, and, and I understand her concern. Um, again, I think we can solve some of the drainage issues, you know, make positive steps to, to correct those adjoining our lot. And, uh, and we think, you know, being, being the responsible thing to do is to pave the alley adjacent to us, but we're not looking to pave the whole thing. Uh, we think that'd be a, a, a tough issue. And again, an issue for subsequent phases of the development. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions the commission may have, and we would appreciate your support tonight. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Yeah, I don't know if you have this information, but uh, we heard something about the Project 80 drainage um, project out in this area. I don't know. Hey, I'm not. There was some drainage probably done at one time, I guess. But in your opinion, what do you th think the solution is? I mean, it seems like an area drainage issue that there needs to be a comprehensive drainage plan for the area, maybe some extensions of sewer or, or a drainage um, system throughout the area. And drive in the alley. Localized yeah, the drive in the alley south of us. Um, the grades look pretty flat, and it seems to kind of roller coaster, and there seems to be some low spots in there that accumulate drainage. Um, it, it looks to me like they need a storm drain system and, and a, a, a paved alley that, that maintains its grade. Um, what about the rest of the neighborhood? Is there, um, I mean, you're not the planner for the neighborhood, but is it the extensive drainage issues throughout the neighborhood, do you know? Not that I noticed. You know, Dawson Street itself is in good condition. Um, it has curve and gutter and, and positive drainage. I didn't notice any, any ponding along Dawson itself, um, south of us. Um, and again, through our property, it has pretty good fall, so there's no drainage issues in Dawson next to our property. I think it's mostly the alleys, the issue. Okay, thank you. Done, Mr. Spring. Mr. Cage. Thank you. Mr. Just one Pelley. quick question. Do you know what the um, existing vegetation is to the south of the proposed residential? Uh, I mean, is there some old growth trees there? There is some old growth trees around the existing house. Okay. Yeah. Imagine those based on what you're currently proposed. Uh, you know, would they stay to give a little more privacy to the residential house to the south, or is it something that maybe you have to plant? We, we are looking to save any trees we can. Um, we, we don't look to, to knock trees down, but honestly, I see most of those trees going and planting uh, new vegetation. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Smalley. Um, the, so does the alley drain to the south, the proposed alley that you expect may be paved? 
Um, a portion of it drains north, and then and then somewhere along there, there's a grade break, and it, and it goes south. There's there's a high spot in there somewhere. And did you say you anticipate having storm drain in there, or no? Um, we anticipate extending storm drain um, south on Dawson, because Dawson drains north, um, and then into our project. Um, if we need to extend it all the way over to the alley to adequately drain the alley adjacent to us, we'll do that. Um, and then do you know how far south the alley's unpaved before it meets a road? The, the remainder of the alley is unpaved. I, I, okay. Um, That's all. Mr. Robinson. Um, if you were to, if you were to um, build this out without a residential building initially, would you build the parking that's shown on the southern lot at the same time that you built the commercial portion? Um, no, we would build the, the two-way aisle and then not the parking. And that's not, I mean, there, yeah. would there be, would there be, maybe this is a question for staff and I'm just curious, is there anything that precludes under this zoning using the southern lot for parking without a residential use on the, on the lot? Uh, street parking through the chair. Uh, street parking um, as a principal use is a conditional use in the R4 or RO. In the RO. So if it's a different lot and there's no other use and there is parking on it, it wouldn't work without a conditional use separately? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions for the applicant? Any further questions at all? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you you may have Chairman. a seat. Mr. Uh, before before a motion comes up, I'll remind all the commissioners uh, with a five-member board, it's pretty hard. So just count noses on that. Um, before before we get any further, with five members, what does it take to pass? Is it, is it four? Mr. Chair, it takes five positive votes. Okay, it still takes, okay, five positive votes, okay. Remember that, everybody. Um, I hereby close the public hearing on case 2015-0084. Mr. Spring. Uh, yes, I want to try a motion, and uh, I'm not sure I have a complete sense of what the commission is, uh, but I'll try to make a motion that will fly, but we never know. Um, with respect to case number 2015-0084, uh, request to rezone lots 4, 5, 6, block 8 of Northern Lights subdivision from R4 and RO to ROSL. I uh, recommend the approval of the rezoning with the following conditions. Um, excuse me. Um, this is the condition that the petitioner submitted as part of the ordinance to the municipal assembly. Uh, the southern, uh, at least part of it, the southern 75 feet of the property shall be developed as a multi-family use not, an ad, not adding the words with the minimum of six dwelling units. That would be deleted. And uh, condition number two, or special limitation number two, uh, there should be constructed a six-foot high fence along the southern property boundary. That's it. I think we heard the applicant say a six-foot high solid wood fence. Oh, uh, I will accept that. Okay. Yes. We have a, a motion, we have a second. If I may, um, anyone need that motion read back? Any questions? Any further discussion? Mr. Cange. Thank you, uh, through the chair. I tend to support this motion, I think, um, removing the department's recommendation may alleviate some of the residents' concerns that 
there might not potentially be a, a six unit development there should the developer not. Um, I also think that um, you know it's hard to do this without a completed land use uh, plan that the municipality is currently working on but I have to assume that um, more uh, dense um, units in this area might be something that they're looking at along Benson. Um, I think that uh, the land is underutilized currently and this is consistent with the comprehensive plan so I will be supporting the motion. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, I'll, I'll be supporting the motion. I, um, I think the most challenging thing is when we have these R3 and R4 lots that were rezoned that were primarily platted as single family lots and, uh, and we grew as a community and we rezoned them and we struggle with these whenever they, they, you know, they, they come up and you sort of decide whether or not these neighborhoods you know, transition or not and, and the reality is, is the zoning already says that it can transition. Um, I think that the, what I heard here tonight was that there are challenges and issues with the infrastructure primarily in, in the area. I mean, I, I heard some issues related to the, the land use, but, but I think what we're saying is at some point there is a, a break and a transition point, and this proposal uniquely makes that transition within the proposal, not at, not at the edge. It sort of does both. But sometimes I believe that putting a project together helps shine light on parts of the municipality that could need upgrades. And some of those upgrades um, clearly are, are going to be taken care of by the proposed uh, uh, petitioner, but also it sounds like there's a need for the municipality to look for ways to upgrade um, the area. Mr. Spring? Yes, I'm glad uh, Mr. Robson mentioned that because I think that is a big issue. And I think uh, the municipality has an obligation to make sure that there's infrastructure capable of supporting a zoning district, especially an intensive zoning district like R4. And this whole area needs to be looked at. And I know there's some, um, some movement among the municipal assembly to do or re resurrect the Midtown plan and uh, do some more work on that. And I think that would be the context where we should be looking at these things. What kind of improvements are needed in this area and what kind of improvements are the, is the municipality willing to put into uh, as far as funding it so that you can support the development that the zoning calls for here. And I would like to add that, make sure that's added to the minutes or added to the findings of, our, of the commission so that the, the assembly knows that there's a need to do that and proceed with the plan update for this area so we can do that. Thank you very much. Any further comments? Would you please use your machines? That motion passes. Um, now we'll do findings. Um, I've, Mr. Spring, you're clean. Mr. Cange. Just as a finding, I know I stated this in my earlier comment, but th this is consistent with the comprehensive plan with regard to mixed use development, specifically policies 10, 15, and 20. And, and although there, the public was not in support of uh, this particular development, I don't think it was so much the rezoning. I think it was a lot of the other issues with regard to, to drainage. Um, and there were no adverse agency comments provided in our packet. I'd like to also add that to the findings. Thank you. Mr. Spinelli, Mr. Robinson. I just said I, I hope my earlier comments when I, when I provided my rationale for support were, would be included as findings as well. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to add on findings that we heard from the neighborhood strongly that the, there's issues with the alley. And if we're going to follow through with the um, heavier development in this area. We got to get the, the drainage and the traffic caught up with it. And that's a, an action by the municipality, not the applicant in this case. That completes case 2015-0084. Um, before we go to the next case, let's take about a five minute break and then we'll come back and we will go to case 2015-0084. Manusco Electric Association Utility Subdivision. Thank you very much.
Yes. Are you, is your applicant been informed of the nature of the short board we're under tonight? Yes, they have been. Have they decided to go ahead or not? Yes, to go ahead. Okay, thank you very yeah, much. We appreciate you. that. Uh, can we have a staff report on case 2015-0085, Manusco Electric Association, a conditional use permit for a utility subdivision, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'd like to point out uh, late comments from the community council that were laid on the table for the commission. And um, MEA is requesting a conditional use uh, permit for uh, a utility substation. Um, the proposed electrical substation uh, will be needed to deliver electricity to the powder reserve plant community. Um, in terms of the general standards for a conditional use, um, uh, the, the proposal um, brought, uh, brought to us by the applicant uh, furthers the goals and policies of the comprehensive development plan. That standard is met. Uh, the Chugiak Eagle River uh, comprehensive plan update uh, policy for public facilities and service goals um, states uh, provide public facilities and services that are located, designed, and maintained to accommodate current and future needs of the area in an effective, cost-efficient, and timely manner. Um, this uh, this uh, facility will do that, uh, uh, conforms to the standards uh, for that use in this title. That standard is met as well. Uh, the PC district uh, requires uh, electrical substations to obtain a conditional use approval, um, although there are no specific uh, conditional use standards for utility substations. Uh, will be compatible with the existing and planned land uses in the surrounding neighborhood. That standard is met as well. Um, the use compatibility does not appear to be an issue. The proposed substation building pad will be set back uh, 30 feet from the northwest uh, property boundary, 50 feet from the northeast, and southwest property boundaries and 40 feet from the southeast property boundary. Um, the area outside the fence is naturally vegetated and will be left undisturbed um, uh, while um, this uh, project is constructed. The natural vegetation will provide sufficient buffering uh, for surrounding properties which are intended to be developed um, with residential homes uh, in the future. Um, in terms of uh, will not have a, uh, a permanent negative impact um, that standard is met for this project. Um, this is an unstaffed uh, electrical substation. It will not generate significant traffic as service trucks will only visit the site monthly. Vehicular access to the site will be uh, from a 24-foot uh, wide uh, gravel driveway within a 70-foot wide public use easement that connects to Terrace Lane. Um, the site uh, will not need uh, public water and sewer. Um, there will be no generators um, on the property um, at this site, and uh, the proposed electrical substation will be compatible with the surrounding area. The site abuts a 70-foot wide public use easement to the northeast, a 140-foot wide utility corridor to the southeast. The northwest and southwest uh, is uh, currently undeveloped. Future residential development is proposed there. Um, the neighboring properties that with a density in the range of three to six residential dwelling units per acre. Um, uh, this project provides adequate buffering uh, uh, for that uh, future development. The department's recommending approval of the petitioner's um, application and request subject to four conditions, one through four on page five of your packet. Standards one, or conditions one and two are standard. Um, condition three is to resolve with DOT the need for a driveway permit onto Terrace Lane. That's something that they requested with their comments. Um, condition four, the land use permit shall include a requirement to pay the first 50 feet of the driveway uh, off of Terrace Lane. That's to help transition from a gravel road to a paved road. And I, that was re uh, requested by either traffic or private development or both, but that was something that's been discussed. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions and the petitioners here to make a presentation as well. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for staff? Comment condition four. I don't know if I know what that means. Is the 50 foot, the 50 foot outside the petition site, inside the petition site? Does it start start on Terrace Lane? Does it start on the unnamed road? Um, I, I support the idea of a 50-foot, but I think 
we, we got to define it better at some point in time uh, on that. Come, re re reply? Sure. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. It would be from uh, Terrace Lane. Immediate, it would be from where the, the paving ends uh, and the, the, the driveway begins, and that would be off of the, the paved street. Um, and these sorts of things, I, I prefer to leave up to uh, discussions with the traffic engineer about. Okay. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, public hearing. Persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the Commission Rules and Procedures. Petitioners, including all of his or her representatives, get 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for rebuttal. Representative groups get five minutes. Individuals get three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the Commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the Commission. An individual may have appeal rights relating to the action the Planning Zoning Commission takes except commission recommends to the assembly, which are not appealable. Appeals may be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after approval of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the resolution, which is the commission's final decision. A fee for the appeal is required at the time of filing. Um, I read that every time because if I don't, Lori jabs me with a pen. I want you all to know that and, and learn that on that. Is the applicant here, and would you please come forward and state your name? and spell it for the record. Hello everyone, my name is Julie Esty. The last name is spelled E-S-T-E-Y. I'm the Director of Public Relations at Matanuska Electric Association and I'd like to introduce my team that I have with me. Uh, first is Ed Jenkin, he is a Senior Distribution and Transmission Engineer with MEA and he'll be happy to handle the technical questions. We have Tom Dreyer with the S4 group who's been helping us navigate some of the uh, municipal codes and permitting and he can answer questions around that. Um, also we have Jim Arneson with Arneson Land Services previously with the Klutna Inc. and Tim Potter, Planning Director with Dowell Engineers who are part of the uh, master plan, the Klutna's master plan for this area. And so we brought them along for historical context in case you guys have questions. Um, as staff mentioned, this is part of a larger master plan uh, that has been approved by this body. And we also have uh, Steve Connolly, currently a manager with Eklutna, and Will Webb, a traffic engineer who's been doing some work on that if there are any questions about traffic implications. Uh, as staff mentioned, the MEA is applying for a conditional use permit for a new substation. Uh, in the Birchwood North Eagle River area, the substation will support the new Eklutna uh, powder reserve development and other growth in the area. It's part of the larger master plan, again, that was approved uh, previously. We, based on need, we'd like to construct a substation with a 115 kV ring bus configuration. Not only will that help meet the anticipated demand, but it also does two additional things. It helps us improve reliability by helping us uh, isolate transmission line disturbances, basically reducing the impact of any outages on the transmission line. And it also helps us meet the requirements of the Eklutna operating committee who is the owners of the transmission line that this will connect in with. They have reliability standards that are built in to the process to ensure that our efforts do not negatively implicate, impact their line and that is one of their standards as well. Uh, the design is for eventual two transformers and four feeders to come out of the substation. The plan is to install one transformer and two feeders initially and uh, then expand as demand dictates. We wish they all went like this. Um, as far as Eklutna coming to us with a plan, a master plan, and asking the utility, can your current system meet this plan? We did the modeling based on their expansion plans and decided we could do the initial maybe one or two phases, but once it expands beyond that, the adjacent substations are not, do not have the capacity to meet this load. So uh, this is an example of really smart community planning and, and we applaud Eklutna's proactive uh, conversations with us so we can use a proactive approach. Uh, the construction timeline will be demand driven. So our goal in this is to, if this conditional use permit is approved, to purchase the land, do the initial clearing on the land, 
fence the land and then put a sign up that says future home of a substation so that future decisions can be made in full transparency. And then as the demand drives up the need for the new substation, it will be built. Uh, so you have all the technical details and specifications in front of you in our packet. Um, MEA has learned a lot since the last time we were in front of this commission about engaging the community. And um, we've been engaging the community earlier and in a very more, and in a more meaningful way than in the, um, on this project. We've been discussing this project with the Birchwood and Chugiak Community Councils for over a year, making presentations at several meetings. We held an additional open house that was open to the public with all of our plans and drawings. We did additional rendering so that the community could understand a little bit better what the substation would look like and also did a site walk where community members could come and walk the property and, and get a sense of what that looked like. It was presented uh, to the Chugiak Eagle River Advisory Board, W.O. Sanders Group, uh, for comments as well. And community feedback has been incorporated into the site selection, the design. Uh, for example, we've added additional vegetation buffer than is required by code, minimizing the lighting as much as possible, et cetera. Community members have been really great to work with on this, and we appreciate them and Eklutna being partners and understanding the need for this project as well. So thank you for considering this application. I'll stop now to reserve some time later in the proceeding if it's necessary, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Commissioner Spring. Yeah, just curious, uh, where <clears throat> what does the uh, transmission line come into this? Um, substation area. The current the Eklutna, uh, and depending on where you're looking, the current Eklutna operating committee lines, which again are the, the existing lines that are co-owned by MLMP, Chugach Electric, and MEA, um, run just adjacent to the property. Um, Along the um, water, the Eklutna water easement, is that generally where it goes? Tom, do you want to come in? orient to the existing master plan. Yeah. Oh, it should be on one of your pages in here, Mr. Spring. Um, you can see it on page C1. That's a landscaping plan. There's no page numbers, I guess, on the packets. Once they get past a certain range of numbers. But in, in the back of your packet, there's quite a few drawing showing the existing lines and the new proposed lines that will come in to track down. You can see its location on page B3, which again, there's not a packet page number on it. So it's about the 10th page from the end of the packet. Yeah, I saw that. I wasn't sure where that, I can't see yeah, it's, where it comes into the powder reserve. Is that? Yeah, it's coming in between that oh, okay. 187 and 188. Right, so it goes through, is that where it goes through currently? Is this a new line or is it? Um, well, uh, here's, uh, the line goes along the same right of way that the Klutna water line does. It's 140 foot wide easement. There's, I, uh, I think it was a 54 inch water line and there's a overhead power line that's about 90 feet tall existing. So, so what is the new part of that line or is it all there already? What, I, I, is there, what's the new portion of the line or is it already there? Oh, the, the new portion would be they'd add one pole uh, between two of the poles that are existing there now oh, they're already to there. tee off of that and then it goes straight into the track dam site. Oh, so it continues down the water line and serves other neighborhoods then. So it's already an existing transmission line. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see it on that page B3. Okay. You get a, a visual of it. There's a cross-sectional view of it and there's also a plan view up on the top in color. It looks like that additional pole is pretty large. Yeah, they high. run around 90, 95 feet tall in that area. Mm -hmm. But that's not part of the conditional use. That's, that would be allowed. That's going to be built. That's not part of the conditional use. That, that would be the feeder line into track M for the conditional use. The conditional yeah. use only applies the area of track M. So this is outside of it, so it wouldn't be part of the conditional use. 
uh, it's not a big question, yeah. not, a, not mm -hmm. a very important question probably, but yeah, we, don't, we aren't approving that big tower. In other yeah, words. correct. There's not a conditional use okay. required for the, the existing utility okay, uh, easement you. line. Are you finished, Mr. Spring? Mr. Robinson? It's quite the luxury to plan a substation where there are few homes around it. It feels that way. Uh huh. Um, the comments that were that we got from Birchwood Community Council, um, I think, generally says that they're okay with the the, sub, uh, the substation and sort of commends you for working with them. But it does talk about a desire for additional vegetation, and, and while I, I, I don't know that that's needed, could you tell me on the on the site plan what is what is the um, the buffer side that is the one that is is in the view shed of neighbors along Terrace Lane. Is that the northeast boundary side? Is that what that is? Okay. Some of these drawings side. aren't oriented to the north, so it can be a little confusing sometimes. You can see on the last, see it's about the second and third page from the end of your packet. Page C3 and C4. showing two different views and cross-sectional views from existing houses that are the closest to this parcel across the existing developments. Do, do, you, do you have page C3 and C4? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the one, if I look at C3, that's, those are the, that's all terrace lanes. So really they're talking about kind of the both, both sides almost, the northeast and the southeast would be the primary view sheds, is that right? Yes, the, well, we were showing because there, there were some people that were concerned up to the north there, and we just wanted to show them how far away their houses are from Track Dam. As you can see on C3, we're over we're about 1,200 feet away from their house, and then on page C4, we are about 600 feet or so, plus or minus, from the front of their house. And as far as the the buffering goes on the around the perimeter track down uh, current title 21 code only requires 30 feet maximum of a, a buffer zone and we have 50 feet on two of the sides and to the northeast and to the south east it's kind of angled a little bit so it's a little goofy and then 40 feet on the northwestern side and then of course to the southeast along the utility line where the line actually comes in off of the main utility line there uh, we have a 30-foot building setback but we do have we can't allow any tall trees to be in that area because it's a safety issue where, where the main line comes in so we have a limit there I think a special limitation that vegetation can't be taller than six feet and at, actually along that side there, there's no requirement for a buffer because the, the buffer is where you're doing an industrial development or commercial development against a residential. Where th this here is actually 140 foot wide until you actually get to the residential future development on the east side of the utility line. So, so I mean, the, the letter talks about the 50-foot vegetation buffer that, that you have, but really the areas that are the terrace lane, th th those are the view sheds that are, you're actually saying you're, you're somewhat less than, than 50 feet, but you still exceed the 30-foot that's required in the code on, on the two primary view sheds from terrace lane. I'm just trying to figure out how you align with what their comments are since they're not here today. Well, they, I, I think they're referring to the actual buffer yeah. area just around the perimeter of track dam uh, they're not talking about off of terrace lane because from on terrace lane as you can see on c3 and 4 it's 1200 feet to no no I, I know I'm just talking oh. about the, the 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 basically the sides I and mean, we're not talking of square blocks right so the, mm -hmm. the, they just talk about view sheds from terrace lane and I'm trying to figure out which side of the utility substation they're looking at and I think it's the northeast and southeast
Yeah, in their, their third paragraph in the bottom. Yeah, I, I think it just might be a typo there. They don't really mean from Terrace Lane. Because for one, between Terrace Lane and this development, there's a... I don't know. <laughs> All right, thank you. There's a development that, that you guys already approved on between. It's not that, Tom. It's just okay. they're, they're clearly, they're talking about people on Terrace Lane that live off of Terrace Lane, yeah. what they're looking at. And mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what side of the utility substation they're looking at. I uh -huh. think I figured it out. Okay. But it wasn't that hard of a question, I don't think. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other further questions for the applicant? Any questions at all for the applicant? As chair, I must say, I sincerely appreciate MEA's attempt to comply and come forward. This has been much better um, than some of our prior experience, possibly because we're a thousand feet away from some homes. But anyway, uh, <laughs> on that one, no. Uh, I appreciate the outreach and the attempt to make the community, and it makes our job much easier on that. You have five minutes left for rebuttal. We have no further comments. Okay, thank you very much. In regards to case 2015-0085, what is the wish of the body? Oh, wait a minute. I hereby close. Anybody else wish to testify? Anybody else at all? I close the public hearing. Mr. Cange. Thank you. With regard to case 2015-0085, um, conditional use permit for utility substation, I move to approve the conditional use permit um, in accordance with 21.50.020, subject to conditions 1 through 4, as outlined in our staff packet on page 5. We have a second by Commissioner Spring. Do we have any comments or questions? Mr. Spring. Yeah, there doesn't really seem to be any issues regarding impacts of this. I, um, there was the comment by the Birchwood Community Council to maybe add additional buffer to the uh, bordering terrace lane. But I think what we have to think about is that there's gonna be future development around this site. Um, Powder Reserve is gonna develop the area away from Terrace Lane is going to have probably single family houses there. So it's important to maintain the buffer for future houses as well as the existing. So I would not recommend changing the buffer, especially if that means shortening the buffer on the other sides. It's just going to impact future residences more. So I, I appreciate the uh, planning that went into the, uh, the development of this. And I think um, uh, the issues have been resolved and I will be supporting the motion. Uh, I will be supporting the motion also, but um, John brings up a very good point. This may be 10 or 20 years, and you guys should stay in touch with the community councils going forward um, so that we don't have issues coming up. I mean, as you can see, sometimes if a little bit of effort, effort up front makes your job down the road a lot easier. Um, on that. Do we have anything else, any other comments before we, we vote? Seeing and hearing none, please use your machine. That motion carries. As that motion is approved. Any other findings? I would just like to add that um, the, the electrical substation is consistent with the goals and policies of the 20. 2006 Chugach Eagle River Comprehensive Plan. I think that the agency comments were met in the recommendations. And um, that's all I have. <laughs> Mr. Robinson? Yeah, I could. <laughs> it's more importantly that they could. I mean, I'd like to, to comment that there, there was no public testimony, but there was a letter received from the Birchwood Community Council uh, indicating that the standards have been met and uh, that, the, uh, that there's been adequate transparency for the community. And I'd say for the, the community of current as well as future uh, residents. Okay, the, nothing, nothing else before us. The chair would accept a motion to adjourn.
Okay. Uh, where is he? There he is. He's hiding okay. back there. Okay. Hal, stand up. Hal, Hal Hart is our new um, director. Yes, that's correct. Planning director. Uh, this is a short board. We frequently go to midnight. You're welcome to come and bring your pajamas and stay with us on it. And uh, I encourage you to get to know your commissioners. Okay, we, uh, Mr. Keynes made a motion to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Spring. No, I have Oh. Hey, I just, sorry, go ahead. I had a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Of, uh, committee room. Okay, we just meant, well, Mr. Keynes is first. Well, I was going to do the same thing as just kind of give a committee report, Tyler and I, and I'll defer to Mr. Spring no, at I, first. I'd like to do yours first then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief, but um, Tyler and I have been attending the uh, new what is it, Title 21 Committee, but it's now uh, a long acronym. Economic and Community Development Something Committee. Or yes, and so we've been working on various issues that include marijuana land use plan, and I'm also on a subcommittee dealing with cell phone uh, towers uh, and drafting legislation. So we're in the very early stages of all of this right now, but uh, we have been going to weekly meetings and we're making some progress on uh, the marijuana land use and cell tower and sign ordinances, so expect um, I, big things. The, the so chair and the rest of the commission sincerely appreciate your efforts. Mr. Spring. I, I see Eric is not here, so maybe the staff doesn't know this, but, uh, or won't know the answer to this, but the marijuana ordinance is coming up for October, is that right, to the commission? Okay, so we, we'll, we'll be hearing, a, having a public hearing on it. Okay, so it's our understanding that we will have a, a public. You're, are you that far along with the marijuana ordinance? That there's a draft? Put something together to see if they could get it in front of the assembly, but I don't think that's going to happen in time for the October. So for a lot of these, we're looking more towards December. So this will be more like a work session then where we won't be at looking at an ordinance. Well, I then. think once the proposed ordinance comes out, we'll get it on our calendar, is my understanding. But I don't think that's going to happen in October. I, the ordinance, okay. So it sounds like though it might be delayed, perhaps. But the chair may encourage that to go to November, Mr. Robinson. I don't know, if John, if you were done, but I'm going to jump in and say that uh, on, on the same committee, just 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 some history on the Title 21 uh, movement that there were two ordinances that came through this body. Uh, we moved them both forward. They've now been, in effect, uh, proposed to be somehow, you know, merged um, with an ordinance of which I don't remember the, the, the number. Do you remember, Tim? 76, is that right? So do you know what the new, new, new one is? It was laid on the table. I was told it was to be laid on the table on Tuesday. And uh, for uh, in, in for public hearing September 29th. So there will be a now merged ordinance that takes pieces of the two ordinances that came through here uh, for public hearing at the assembly. I just don't remember the n the number of that ordinance, but for public hearing on September the 29th at the assembly, they did not come back to us. They felt like most the the issues that were there were issues that by and large were issues that we had dealt with in the ordinances that we had acted upon. Um, not to dwell on the marijuana ordinance, but um, there's deadlines though they have to meet for implementing this, the, the ballot measure and I think it's February. I think we're gonna, if we're gonna be involved in the um, ordinance, we're gonna have to clear the slate I think and make sure that we can uh, deal with it in a timely manner because it's gonna be uh, you know, they've they got to be able to have a regulation so that they can open up the shops or whatever. Not, not that I care, but. You seem to care an awful lot. It's just the state law. I mean, it's just, it's requirement, it's a ballot measure and there's things that need to be done. So I, I'm afraid that the timeline's getting really, really short on it. And, um, we also have land use plan map floating around the middle of this thing too. Yeah, there's a lot coming forward, I think. And, and uh, I will just say that um, the, the chair of that committee 
uh, Assemblymember Domboski has, has asked that we contemplate making ourselves available for more than two meetings a month as we get into November and December. So, I mean, she's, she's asked us because I think especially, and I, I think especially related to the uh, land use plan map, um, that they want to get it through by the end of the year, and to do that, we're not doing it in, in, in our regularly scheduled meetings. So I don't think we have enough people to talk about that here today, but it's going to it's going to come up. Be ready for an a extra meeting here or there. You too. <laughs> I was going to make a motion that we um, we not let the chair leave the uh, committee for another. We are term. adjourned. <laughs>